welcome to me, um, uh, to you, to the second of our interactive panel sessions. The title of this session is Challenging the New Inequalities Brought About by the Pandemic and the Underlying Inequalities Made Explicit and Intensified by the Pandemic, Inequalities in Health, Education, Income and Wellbeing. Um, one of the big threads that's already been going through our discussions and also on the Twitter feed has been the theme of inequality and inequity. Inequality as an abdication of leadership and inequalities in data availability leading to diminished uh, capacity to tackle the pandemic and inequalities in our capacity to ensure resilience for populations across the globe. So this panel is coming at absolutely the right moment in the conference to pick up on that theme. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the stage uh, Professor Kev Daliwal, who is the Professor of Molecular Imaging and Healthcare Technology at the University of Edinburgh, and he is a consultant physician in respiratory medicine. Catherine Hay, who is the Deputy Director of Gender Equality at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Vibhu Sharma, who is the Disability and Inclusion Research Consultant for the global charity Their World and one of our leading alumni. Uh, Dr. Sham Syed, the Quality Lead for the Division of Universal Health Coverage and Life Course at the World Health Organization. Dr. Carrie Lunan, Chair of the Scottish Deep End Group a group of GPs who are serving the 100 most deprived populations in Scotland. And she is the immediate past chair of the Royal College of General Practice in Scotland. And Sarah Brown, chair of Their World and executive chair of the Global Business Coalition for Education, who has very kindly agreed to facilitate this panel. Welcome all. Thank you very much indeed for participating in this, uh, this conference. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. So handing over now to Sarah, thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. And uh, I'm really uh, privileged to be leading this panel today and facilitating it because we have a fascinating uh, group of speakers here for you today. So to maximize our time, uh, we've got uh, less than half an hour. I'm gonna give each speaker their, their turn on, you know, speaking to you, and we're not gonna come back around. We just wanted to get the most out of each contribution. Um, our focus is obviously on the new inequalities and looking at those, but really trying to push for quite practical steps for where we can take this conference actions beyond today. So I'm gonna start with Professor Kev Daliwal. And Kev, I'm gonna to turn to you to specifically ask the question about the inequalities that the pandemic has brought into focus and why they're so critical for future health. And thinking of your expertise as a respiratory consultant and your focus on the use of healthcare technology, what are the big opportunities now? So, so thank you, Sarah, and thank you um, to the organisers. So, so going to the first question, I think that what we've seen has been an horrendous exhibition of the inequalities in healthcare and the disproportionate morbidity and mortality that we see in our patients arriving at the front door and really succumbing to the consequences of the virus, um, and particularly lower socioeconomic strata, black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups are vulnerable, especially in the UK, which has got some of the highest death rates in the world. It's been very sad to see this in successive waves of the virus. So as front door clinicians, we're seeing the most vulnerable come to the front door. Um, and, and that really has highlighted the vulnerability of, you know, of, of equitable health care, protection, education across the piece. And that that's pervasive across both COVID-19, but also clearly ag ag against many other health challenges that we face. But moving forward in terms of you know, what, what do we see as opportunities? Well, I think just like anything, a reset is now needed. Um, in, in war times, we often see the biggest advances in healthcare technology. And we've seen the same thing happen here um, during COVID, that we've seen massive jumps in vaccines and therapies. We've had mentioned experimental medicine, but really data at the heart of discoveries and novel approaches moving forward. So I think we have to think about how we address these inequalities using te technology as, as a vehicle. And so frugal innovation, I think how do we widening access to, to some of these technologies. Now, as a respiratory consultant going back, um, this is not surprising currently for infection. So each year we see 1.5 million deaths from tuberculosis every year. And that's still intractable and that still affects the poorest in society. Um, but if we go to the end, what's the biggest opportunity? I do think what COVID has done for us definitely is it has highlighted the need to be connected, to partner, to think on a global scale. 
And definitely the phrase that we've always used before is that we're fighting disease, not each other. And nowhere in our recent times has that been more important now. That COVID has brought many people together and we must reset. We must reset as a society. We must reset our governmental framework and outlooks in terms of actual access and how that have we marginalised different parts of society to have poor, um, poor access to healthcare. Um, so I think what it's done for us, it really has refocused our efforts to bring people together. And we now now for the rest of our lives and careers for productive things that we're going to do, we're going to focus on impactful activities. And that what, that's what we all must do, I think, moving forward. So I'm, I'm hopeful of the future. I've seen massive jumps, but this, this conversation is vital, Sarah, and others around this, because we must reset. Thank you. Thank you, Kev. Um, I'll turn to Catherine Hay next. With your role, uh, with a leading role in gender equality as the Deputy Director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Foundation's been very vocal. We've heard a lot from the principals of the Foundation, from um, many members of it, about highlighting the inequalities in this pandemic. I think right from the beginning, um, there were actions taken by the Foundation there. Looking at the most serious consequences for those ever widening gaps around not just health, but also the social and economic spheres. Just to get your response, and I know you'll talk through the lens of gender equality and very specifically women's economic equality. How effective are the measures being taken to mitigate those gaps? And what pathways do we need to work on to achieve the global goals? Thank you, Sarah. And and yes, yeah, certainly, I think the, the both Bill and Melinda have been um, really strong champions, have been articulating uh, the differential impacts, obviously, particularly the immediate health impacts, but uh, but also some of the other impacts and, and the gender impacts uh, in particular as well. Um, in every country, in every community, the pandemic has brought really, I think, into sharp focus everywhere in the world, uh, the inequities all around us, in some cases really surfacing inequities that perhaps uh, had been somewhat below the surface. Uh, and with our partners around the world, we've been really also looking at the gender impacts of the pandemic and, and uh, you know, it is alarming. Um, we are looking at potentially years, if not decades of effort to close gender equality gaps in high, medium, low income countries being uh, at risk of, of being eroded. Uh, I'm going to take just childcare, employment and small businesses by way of examples. Let me start with childcare. One and a half billion children, school age children, have been affected by school closures. Uh, is there anyone at this conference who is not impacted in some way by one and a half billion children affected by school closures? Uh, my two children at home have not entered a school building in 11 months. Um, and so, yes, while both men and women are spending time on childcare and schooling, the majority of extra work, and we're tracking this, uh, around the world is falling on women and adolescent girls. Um, and even as women are getting more unpaid work, such as childcare work, they're losing more paid jobs. Most countries around the world have obviously seen a significant decline in employment overall, but a steeper decline in employment for women than men. So women are leaving employment to care for children and women are more likely to work in hard hit sectors that have been really hit by the pandemic, like retail and food services. Um, and informal workers are really struggling. Again, mostly women. Their work was already less secure. They have fewer benefits, fewer protections. They just don't have the safety nets. Finally, women-led businesses, and I know this is, you know, I'm sort of rolling out a negative set of, of, of stats here, but women-led businesses are more likely to fail. Again, there, there's a range of reasons for that, many of them uh, underpinned by gender norms, but they're also just more likely to be in sectors that have been really hard hit by the pandemic. But you didn't ask me just about problems, you asked me about solutions. Mm -hmm. This erosion of progress that we're seeing um, that we've painstakingly made over the last few decades to close these gender gaps isn't inevitable because we do know how to close these gaps. We know what works. We can build it into stimulus and loan programs. Let's take women's enterprise or women's businesses. Training and mentoring programs for women entrepreneurs works. Cash grants to female owned businesses work. Bringing women together in collective enterprise works. If you just take the last example, 
while it can be really difficult for individual women entrepreneurs to get um, financing, particularly in low and middle income countries for a range of reasons, it can be difficult for them to access markets, uh, can be difficult for them to go around middlemen. If they come together with other women in collectives, we've seen that that can be a way for them to overcome those those barriers. For example, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, Sewa, has nearly two women, women, two women, two million members. Um, many of them are self-employed. Many of them are part of collective enterprises. And both approaches, uh, both they make women visible, women workers visible, and they help underpin collective action. And that collective action and that solidarity uh, around the world is critical because business supports, I just gave one example, are not enough. Um, we need to safely reopen schools and child care centers. We need to make child care more affordable. For example, in Nairobi, in Kenya, daycare vouchers to reduce the cost of child care, increase mother's employment, and then in turn increase their income by 24%. Governments need to help child care centers weather the pandemic through subsidies and improve wages uh, of those child care workers. We need to improve the conditions for child care workers. Until child care is available, reopen and affordable. In the meantime, we have to compensate families for the lost earnings. Mm -hmm. We need to pay for alternative child care arrangements. Mm -hmm. We need to extend flexible work conditions so that they can juggle child care and employment. And we need to extend these measures beyond those of us in full-time work and get creative about getting those protections to self-employed, part-time or informal workers. And, you know, people can say, well, that's impossible. Uh, you know, it can't be done. And it certainly can't be done in low income countries, but it can. For example, Ethiopia got a benefit like this to women working on a public works program. So it can be done. Yes, countries are and will face tough choices in dealing with the costs of recovery. The more likely path maybe is going to be the opposite of what I just described, imposing austerity measures to reduce debt, something many of us have seen. But we know that that comes at an enormous cost to our communities, our economies, our social systems, and to gender equality. Investing in gender intentional business supports, social protections, and childcare all of which remove barriers to women's full economic participation, on the other hand, will facilitate a more inclusive uh, recovery and a more inclusive society. And they'll have positive economic impacts. They'll be spending, employment, mental health, and well-being. They require public and private resources, progressive taxation, new types of partnerships, creativity. But perhaps most of all, they require a desire for the hardships of the last year to have mattered to have led us, to have pushed us to something, to build something better. And to the next generation of researchers here today listening, they're also gonna require new policy and research and scholarship because so much of that work has really been blind to gender and other differences. But I think here too, the pandemic pushes us to build new conversations, new connections, new knowledge, new solidarities, as we're seeing today at the event, uh, an opportunity to build something better and indeed to imagine uh, new futures. Thank you. Thank you so much. And having set out really quite big intractable problems at the start, you went on to make very positive um, recommendations. So there's a lot to take forward from that. Now, I'm going to turn next to Vipu Sharma, who's a disability and inclusion research consultant with Their World and also has a significant role with the uh, United Nations, um, with, uh, with UNICEF's uh, Generation Unlimited um, work around youth skills. Um, I know your overriding passion, Vipu, is education, and we're bringing it closer and closer to the uh, interconnectedness between education and health. If we look at the close links between education and health, what inequalities did the pandemic heighten? The ones that we knew about and didn't act upon. And why are these so critical for the future of both education and health? What are your thoughts, Vipu, for doing things differently going forward to reduce inequalities? Thank you so much for your question, uh, Sarah. I, I feel as if I'm almost back in my classroom at the university. <laughs> as an alumni, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be invited back as a speaker. Uh, well, going back to your question, uh, the most prominent inequality that strikes me as far as education is concerned has been and is still being the access to education itself and the growing digital divide that has now heightened 
as teaching and learning shifted online over the course of the pandemic. An estimated 1.5 billion people, as my colleague was saying just now, lost access to education, and among them, the hardest to be hit were the people who were already at the margins, and these are people who live in rural areas, people who do not have internet connectivity, or people who simply could not access the online learning because the platforms that were being used to deliver online learning were inaccessible to them due to a disability. And as a matter of fact, these learning inequalities that are now uh, we are seeing as widening uh, would have a direct impact and widen the health inequalities because Obviously, a health, uh, an educated population is aware of taking care of their health. They are employable, so they are able to afford good health care, good housing, sanitation, nutrition, water. They are able to nourish their families and children. But as educational inequalities would now arise, they would give a rise to employment inequalities, which would have a direct impact on the poor health inequalities that I mentioned earlier. And, and as a matter of fact, health inequalities have a very clear potential to lead to more disability, which would lead to more exclusion and inequalities. In fact, education and health are so complicatedly interconnected because if you're healthy only, then you would be able to access education even if you otherwise had access to it and if you were educated only then would you be able to afford good health care because a healthy mind produces a healthy person and we have always known about these inequalities and we are aware that they are going to be heightened the question now however is what do we do to reduce these inequalities well we already know who the marginalized people are who are going through these inequalities that we are talking about, and we need to work collaboratively. Governments need to invest in early childhood education because it is the best way to income, well-being, starting as early as possible with stimulation, nutrition, education, health, and overall holistic development. Secondly, it's easy, it's very easy to talk about inequalities, but it really is about how much we are investing time, effort, energy, money in overcoming some of these inequalities. And I'll take a step back to the digital divide I referred to earlier. And what we need to be doing here is really to develop accessible digital platforms for developing, uh, for delivering education to increase internet connectivity. And it does require a collaborative effort between states, governments, education, businesses, philanthropy. So education could be extended to everyone. And if I had to summarize myself in one sentence, I know that my time is running out. I'll say, let's take care of education. It would take care of everything else. I'll pause here. Thank you, Sarah. Back to you. Vipu shares the same bias I do. Having uh, only ever worked in health for a long time, I find myself increasingly involved in education for the majority of my time. But I will turn it back to Dr. Sham Syed, who has the role as the quality lead at the Division of Universal Health and Life Force for the World Health Organization. Um, Dr. Said, you speak very powerfully about compassion as, a, as being central to quality healthcare. What role does compassion have in a practical way for how we address inequality and shift our ways of thinking? And what can we do to build on changes that we see already happening on the medical and healthcare front line? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for the question and also the opportunity to share some thoughts. Yep, I do consider compassion as central to healthcare quality. And if I may, just let me explain why. Um, between 5.7 and 8.4 million people um, uh, die um, related to quality of poor quality of care in low and middle income countries each year. Um, and on the flip side, um, it's estimated that high quality health systems could prevent 2.5 million deaths from cardiovascular disease 
900,000 of the deaths that Kev mentioned for tuberculosis, a million newborn deaths, and half of all maternal deaths. With that as a frame of reference, I do think that there's a real role for compassion to be linked to the response to developing high quality health systems. And when we say compassion, what do we mean? Um, it could be a seminar in its own right, but compassion, the compassion equation that we might think about is empathy plus action. So empathy plus action. Um, as empathy, while important, is insufficient without the action that's required to really make it into a compassionate equation. And when we look at quality and quality in all of its domains, effectiveness, safety, people-centeredness, timeliness, equity, integrations and efficiency, it gives us a balanced approach to developing future health services and health systems. And if we look at the compassion equation and apply it to those different domains of quality, there's, there's a new novel thinking that can emerge. And there is, in my mind, a fundamental shift that can be made in how services are delivered across the world to place compassion within the DNA of future health services. But let's get a little bit more granular, perhaps, and think about what that might mean at multiple levels. So let's take five levels. First, at the point of care. So as a GP from the UK originally, I recognize that it's never easy, but supporting health workers to apply that compassion equation in each clinical interaction requires long-term investment. And it's actually investment in education and coming back to the points that have been made by others and professional development trajectories. So that's at the point of care. Of course, many, many things that need to happen at that level. Second, at the health facility level, there's a need for compassionate interactions between those that are actually providing the care. And this can instill a culture of quality and compassion. And that needs to be fit for purpose and based on local context. So fra fragile conflict affected vulnerable settings on one hand and really high income, high prosperity systems on the other. Very briefly, third at the sub-national level, when services are being organized, applying the compassion lens can ensure that equity is embedded within how services are delivered. And at the national level, when the compassion equation is applied to strategic direction setting, that can also monitor quality health services with an equity lens. So always bringing the equity lens in. And fifth and finally, remembering and focusing in on the community-based efforts to place compassion within future people-driven health services, I think really is critical. Let's also just remind ourselves that while we know a lot about quality health services, we don't know everything. Uh, and actually in many settings, we know very little. So we do need to come at, the, at this with humility and an ability to continuously learn uh, uh, from all of the work that's already happening across the world um, that we haven't had time to describe in detail, but there are really amazing uh, lights that are being shone on this subject across the world. We need to learn, we need to iterate, and we need to take forward. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sham. Now I'm going to turn to our last speaker in this panel, to Dr. Carrie Lunan, who's the chair of the Scottish Deep End Group. Carrie, you work as a GP in one of Scotland's most deprived communities and have also led work at a national level, most recently as chair of the Royal College of General Practice Scotland, to raise awareness of worsening health inequalities and the potential role that teams of GPs can play in addressing health inequalities. What are your ideas for how we can address those inequalities in health? And what role do you think that GPs play in that? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the um, option uh, for, for, for uh, contributing to this panel, which has been great so far. Um, yes, I've got the privilege of working in a very deprived um, community. And I guess, as we've all been reflecting on, COVID-19 has simply shone a spotlight on pre-existing health and social um, inequalities. and 
we know that, that life was very difficult for many of our patients before, and it has certainly become even more difficult over the last year. Um, if I think about the population that I care for, um, the average life expectancy for men living in some of my practice area is 20 years younger than the most affluent parts of the city. Um, the people that we care for develop diseases of old age, 10 to 15 years younger, um, and they live more of their lives in poorer health and die younger. So it's a, it's a huge problem for us. Um, and I think just a, a quick anecdote, just to, just to highlight some of the key roles that I think that community-based medicine can play in addressing health inequalities. So near the start of the pandemic, when people were frightened and were worried about accessing health care, and we were not hearing from a lot of the people that we would normally hear from on a fairly regular basis, our care coordinator team, which is our receptionists who've been trained up to help people navigate systems and help them link into other parts of the system, generated a list of people that they simply hadn't heard from or hadn't seen um, and made some proactive phone calls to check in with them to ask about domestic insecurity, to ask about financial insecurity, housing insecurity and food insecurity on the basis of having a, an existing trusted relationship with them. And when they made these phone calls, um, people were so relieved to hear from a practice that they knew about because they didn't, they didn't necessarily know that the practice was still open, that healthcare was still operating for, for non-urgent problems. And 80% of those calls ended up in a referral of some description, either to food banks, to uh, women's refuges, to citizens advice bureaus, or to one of the clinicians in the practice. So for me, that tiny snapshot really, at the beginning of the pandemic, really highlighted why it's so important that we have a much more proactive approach to making sure that the people who are missing are being heard and are being cared for. Um, thinking about just generally what the role of general practice and teams within general practice make us, I guess, in many ways, ideally placed to be addressing health inequalities. I guess part of it is that we have huge population coverage. And so we see the vast majority of, of any of our patients on our practice list over a year. And those rates of consultation are even higher in more deprived areas. We often care for families over many, over many generations. And we see people in what we call kind of serial encounters. So many discussions over many years, building up relationships of trust and continuity. Um, and trust is particularly important for many of, of the patients that we care for who haven't necessarily had relationships of, of trust and have had experienced high adversity in early childhood. So a knowledge of populations feels really important. And we know that continuity of care reduces morbidity and reduces mortality. When we're caring for people who live uh, with more chaotic lifestyles um, or live in more poverty, we know that seeing people and offering opportunistic health care is, is very important because, for example, cancer screening rates are much lower in our populations and people tend to present much later. So being able to offer opportunistic health care out in the community is, off, is also really important. And we have this natural hub function where we have lots of links with secondary care, with social care, um, with, with third and voluntary sector, with education. We have frequent conversations with criminal justice with welfare um, and with lots of other systems. So we often act as a kind of conduit for information, often helping to interpret what's happening in patients' um, journeys and, and advocacy and lobbying on behalf of patients is one of the most joyful parts of my job when I'm able to do that on behalf of someone. Often writing a, a letter to ask for more suitable accommodation for a patient is the most effective health intervention that I can make despite all my years of, of scientific training. So it's just thinking out of the box and I enjoy that, that generalist role. I think when I think specifically about the funded projects of the Deep End, and the Deep End in Scotland is a group of 100 practices serving the most deprived populations, we've looked at what are the things that can make a difference on the ground um, to people's health outcomes. And what we know is um, if you embed certain members of the team within practices, within buildings that they trust, within teams that they already know, um, then people's health outcomes improve. So if we have financial inclusion workers and practices helping people with their benefits, um, helping people with debt um, advice and money worries, if we have mental health workers embedded in practices, addictions workers in practices, link workers helping people to navigate our massively complex systems like the NHS, 
then people feel more connected and their health outcomes start to improve because we catch people much earlier on in their journey. We also know that if we can give more time to people with the most complex healthcare needs um, so that we can offer much deeper dive into what's really going on for people and not limit ourselves to just the 10 minute uh, conversations that we're often driven by in general practice and have a much more proactive approach to care planning, bringing together health and social care and have the resource to enable all of those interventions to take place, that it makes a difference and it improves health outcomes. So I think, you know, when I'm thinking about what do we want the future to look like, um, the old normal was not good for a lot of the people that we cared for. And so we don't want to return to that normal. We want to return to a much better new normal. Um, and I think that um, in thinking back to Julian Tudor Hart, who many of you will know, who first described the inverse care law 50 years ago, just this weekend past, uh, described um, the difference, the availability of good medical care, often tending to vary inversely with the populations that need it most, and that that is worse when the, any, when the healthcare is exposed to market forces. So what we need to see as we're moving forward is that healthcare is at its very best where it is needed most, or healthcare, health inequalities will worsen. So we need to target the resource to where it is needed the most. Uh, we need to invest in, in, in training so that there is much more awareness of the of clinicians to advocate on behalf of their patients and have a much more um, informed training scheme around health inequalities. We need to have systems that are inclusive and don't miss people out and don't worsen the digital divide. And if I had one wish that was a quick one, I'd like to see everyone registered with a GP, which is their right, free primary care access, regardless of whether or not you have photographic ID or proof of address. Unless you're registered with a GP, it's very difficult to access the rest of the system. So I would love to see um, some work around that to highlight awareness. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie. So we've heard from all of our speakers from Kev looking at that opportunity to reset and to fight disease and not each other, which are the true words of wisdom. Um, Catherine talking about the ways we can act with an gender intentional way and with a lot of positive and practical suggestions. Vipu's a passionate call for the investment in education uh, to go alongside any thoughts about how we might deliver quality healthcare. And Shams, of course, embedding compassion in the centre and Carrie wanting to see trust in at a community level and being able to roll that out there. So there are a host of positive and practical suggestions there for us to bring out of our panel. And I'll now hand back to Leslie Makara to wrap up this session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me on the main stage now? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for such a deep and insightful discussion um, and for navigating these very complex and interrelated issues for us. Um, there's some um, wonderful comments that are coming through on our Twitter feed and also in the Q&A um, around the need to widen access. That was a theme in the panel, widening access to innovation and technology, access to education, um, collective action. Again, solidarity are themes that are coming through some of these panels and reinforced here today to widen and support and drive gender equality, um, holistic approaches, proactive approaches, um, reaching out, building trust, having continuity in care, the need for advocacy for po populations that are more difficult to reach and are living in deprivation. And then finally, a call for compassion to be a lens through which to drive innovation. And I really love that. Um, that compassion becomes a lens in which we might be able to drive forward innovation. So thank you very much for those very rich insights. Um, that was an extremely enjoyable panel. We now bring this panel to a close. Uh, for the audience, could you remember to click on your return to timeline button and then go on to session, the third interactive session, the Global Commons. And we look forward to welcoming you there. But once again, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, all of the panel, for your really deep and um, inspiring insights. Thank you.